So I think we better get rolling here. Um, welcome. Thank you for coming to the B&H Optic event. This is the uh, first time it's been done, I guess. The first time Swarovski Optic has been there. We're really pleased to, to be here, having a lot of fun with it. Program today is talking about super telephoto lenses, and specifically the Swarovski Optic Modular Spotting Scope Telephoto System, which is a heck of a mouthful. Um, it's a really neat system. It's something that the bird watchers and the hunters know a lot about, and the photographers are just starting to learn about it. So hopefully this will be more of a learning experience. We're going to have some pretty pictures, but you're going to find out some neat things too. So about me, uh, my name is Clay Taylor. I grew up in Connecticut, moved to Texas uh, six years ago. Been with Swarovski for the last 16 years. I uh, started photography in 1970, bought my first SLR, 35 millimeter SLR, which is an old Nicromat FTN, uh, 1971. Started bird watching in 75, uh, started with Swarovski Optic in 99, and I'm still loving birding photography and Swarovski Optic to this day. So there's me in action. Um, uh, that's all the spotting scopes, and yes, you can handhold them depending on what you want to do with it. Uh, everything with photography is, is a, a, a bit of what you want to do with your pictures, how you want to get there. Um, way before bird watching, I used to do this. And the gentleman in the front row taking pictures of it was my <laughs> partner in crime back in the drag racing days in the 1970s. He's Norman Blake, who was otherwise one of the official photographers at Coney Island. Um, so I did drag racing and this was a 500 millimeter telephoto lens, mirror lens that I bought at the old Spiratone store in 1972. And I was in there buying this lens and this big old dude came walking and he goes, oh kid, you're gonna love that lens, it's an awesome lens. Please to meet you, Norman Rothschild. And I went, <gasps> that was the editor of Popular Photography and I read his column every day, so every month. So anyway, uh, so I went from that to doing that. I do bird watching everywhere and take pictures mostly of, of uh, birds. What is digiscoping with a point and shoot camera? Stick your point and shoot camera behind the scope eyepiece and you get that. A wide angle lens view. Zoom the lens of the camera to get rid of the vignetting so I've got a scope at 20 power. The camera zooms so its final image is 25 power. Zoom my scope all the way up to 60 power. Camera's at two times. Final image magnification is 120 power. Birders thought this was wonderful. Hunters thought this was wonderful. Um, they went out and started getting pictures. Of course, if you remember point and shoot cameras back in 2000 and 2002, they were beastly slow. They had little tiny view screens, but you can do stuff like a red tail hawk sitting out at a distance on a hillside, zoom it up. Certainly a nice picture of a red tail hawk if you want to prove you saw we, that you saw a red tail hawk. Crank up the zoom some more, and we start to notice some things. And number one, uh, watch the, the eye sparkle in the eye. If it's not a dot, if it's a line, if it's a squiggle, if it's an arc, you're getting camera shake. Not enough to not make it a, an identifiable red tail hawk picture, but certainly nothing you want to put up on a, on a large print. So we figured out pretty quickly that, oh, here we go. So that's at the end of the sequence there. So uh, after a year or so, um, Back in 2001, 2002, 2003, the price of di digital SLRs was still 8,000 bucks for a body, but point and shoot cameras were what everybody used. So Swarovski Optic and others created adapters to be able to allow you to put your point and shoot camera on scopes. And we had birders and we had hunters running out and taking wonderful pictures. Um, you know, because a spotting scope, can, you can change your power, you can, you can f focus fairly closely, so Dragonflies are hard to get close to with your 100 macro lens, but when you're shooting from 10 feet away, you can fill the frame. This becomes easy. Love sunsets. Always have loved sunsets. Crescent City, California. I went to a bird festival there eight years in a row before I finally got sunset behind the lighthouse, and we had it three days in a row. We had awesome sunsets. Beautiful stuff. Uh, for the astronomers in you, back in 2003, Venus transited across the sun. We were literally out in the parking lot at Swarovski Optic in Rhode Island. We had uh, solar filters on all of the uh, scopes and the binoculars and the entire staff watched Venus crossing the sun. That's the shot with the Coolpix 4500 just as it made contact with the, with the edge of the sun. So there's a lot of neat things you can do with spotting scopes in photography. Uh, around 2005, 2006, the point and shoot started changing. Um, the camera companies took away a lot of the functionalities. No more filter threads for taking accessories like filters and, and l accessory lenses. No more electronic shutter releases. Then the optical zoom ratios grew and when we stick a camera lens behind a scope eyepiece, there were problems as your zooms got bigger and bigger. It, it, they did not optically match up as well. Um, 
A few years later, 2008, Panasonic came out with the first G1, which was the first mirrorless camera. Olympus followed pretty quickly with, with their cameras, and that gave people who didn't want a full-size, big, heavy, bulky SLR an option for doing uh, uh, photography through the SLRs. However, around 2003, no, it was 2004, I'm sorry, Canon broke the $1,000 barrier with DSLRs with the, with the first Digital Rebel. Oh, there was our, our, our flip-up adapter for doing the point-and-shoot cameras. Um, once we had affordable digital SLRs, we started playing, okay, let's, let's mess with this. So here's my Nikon D1 with a 50 millimeter normal lens on it. Stick it on the scope eyepiece, and now I have effectively a 1,000 millimeter lens. Well, this isn't bad. We can also zoom the scope, so there's approximately a 2,750 millimeter lens, and I had to go vertical on them to get them in the frame. Uh, same thing, everybody can see the bird in the red circle quite easily. Yeah, right. Um, that's a, a Wimbrel. Uh, image power, 30 power, so that's effectively a 1500 millimeter lens with the D1. Crank up the magnification some more. So the birders absolutely love this for doing identification shots, rarity documentation, things like that. And as the systems got better, as the scopes got better and the, and the interfaces got better, we were able to start taking better quality pictures for art's sake. So there's our, our initial setup. This is our old spotting scope with a um, the uh, Pentax with the 40 millimeter pancake lens, which was a great little lens, the digital camera adapter. So this was pretty easy. You, you look through your scope, you slid your camera on there, and you, and you got pictures. So very similar to the system we have now, whereas you're looking through your spotting scope, say, ooh, I've got to get a picture of that. Bang, away it goes. Still, that was a 40 millimeter pancake lens. It was designed to take pictures of birthday parties in the Grand Canyon and rainbows and Mickey Mouse. Uh, not designed to be shooting through, through spotting scopes, so there were always interesting little quirks and optical anomalies that popped up. But still, we had a lot of fun with it. Um, the hunters really loved being able to take pictures of things if they couldn't shoot them. Um, this, we actually have this, this photo uh, from an old Canon 10D. So what was that, a six megapixel? We've got that blown up to two foot by three foot on our, on our walls in, in our offices in Rhode Island. It's a beautiful picture. Um, now you have a big telephoto lens. You can start being a photographer. You can play with sunrises and sunsets, on it, which I dearly love to do. Reddish egret running along in, in Florida with, with the sun behind it. Willet at sunrise on uh, St. Augustine uh, uh, um, Anastasia Island State Park. A lot of behavioral stuff you can do, and, and, and especially with the wildlife researchers, we're doing more and more photography and of, of animals. Uh, I'm not sure what he's doing. He may be making an obscene gesture at me. I'm not quite sure, but uh, that's a western grebe out in, in Utah. Who knew that hummingbirds flew upside down? That's what you can get. Uh, this is the famous alligator farm down in St. Augustine, uh, where the alligators are below and the herons are, and egrets are all nesting up top. And here's where I tell the bird watchers, if you're a birder and you want to do digiscoping and get great shots, you use your birding skills to find the bird and you use your knowledge of his, of his habits, of his, of his uh, um, preferences and, and behaviors, and then you use your photographic skills to make sure that you don't wash out the white of the snowy egret against such a dark background. So it's, it's a combination of both if you want to get really great stuff. Um, distant birds or, or spooky birds that are, that are hard to get close pictures of, hawks and owls, eagles, things like that, this is where the, the scope is especially uh, valuable because we can crank the power up to you know, 1,500 millimeters, 1,800 millimeters. So white-tailed kite, this is shot from the car with the, with the scope on the window mount. Um, anybody that has not, not tried to do wildlife photography knows a car, a rolling, car is your best rolling photo blind you can do. If you get out of the car and try and take a picture of it, he's gone. Drive right up to him usually with the car and, and you're in your good shape. Uh, South Texas whitetail hawk. This was out at um, the uh, Bear River Wildlife Refuge in uh, north of uh, Salt Lake City in Utah. And again, just from the window mount, I'm just cruising down the roads. The, the swallows were there and just set up. Within 15 minutes, they were all preening in front of me, and I got all kinds of wonderful shots. This shot actually appeared in uh, Nature Photographer magazine on a uh, digiscoping article. Um, I do go to Costa Rica uh, on business. It's wonderful. Um, we have a fellow down in Costa Rica who maintains all the binoculars and spotting scopes for the guides. So we also get to go and take pictures. Uh, rainforest is a whole other interesting problem when it comes to photography because the light is usually very challenging. 
So we have to do stuff like uh, one two hundredth of a second ISO 800 um, with effectively a thousand millimeter lens. So now getting vibrations and getting balancing done uh, uh, compensated for is very important. But there's all kinds of wonderful opportunities down in Costa Rica for shots. If you, again, know your setups, know your light, your photographer instincts take over, but your, uh, you, now the, um, the scope will let you do these things. In the rain, fiery-throated hummingbird. Um, I tend to use my scope, I take, I take my scope everywhere with me. So, in, and it's, it's great for just getting shots of stuff doing for, for field identification use. Uh, and occasionally you come up with some really, some really interesting pictures. This is a McGillivray's warbler, which is normally pretty skulky. He popped up, chipped at me a few times, I got a few shots, and he was gone. Never saw him again. Sedren is a little, if, you, if you're a birder, a sedren is one of those birds you hear in the grass but almost never see it. You play his tape, his, his recording back to him, and he pops up and, and tries to figure out who is that and why is he in my territory. Get your shots. Um, this is not fog. This is two royal turns on the beach at Anastasia Island, and the wind is blowing about 40 miles an hour. That's actually sand. And I'm hunkered down in the sand dunes getting literally sandblasted. I had, a, I had a, um, a towel over the camera. The scope was just out in the open. Uh, one of the things about spotting scopes, and, and specifically the Swarovski optic scopes, they are totally waterproof. And they are rugged and strong. So at the end of, end of shooting this, I was there for about 30 minutes shooting these guys, stood up and, and sand literally fell off of me. I was, it was all in my hair, covered on the scope. When I got back to the hotel room, I turned on the faucet, stuck the scope under there, got the toothbrush and scrubbed all the grains of sand out of all the cracks in the, cr the crannies, and it's totally fine. So rainy day, doesn't bother the scope. Snowy, icy day, doesn't bother the scope. It may bother me, but not the scope. Uh, this was a grab shot. I pulled up to a dock uh, in, in Oregon, and the, the, the gulls were displaying with each other. I got the scope on, the, uh, on, the, on the, the window mount, got four shots, and then somebody else drove in and threw some bread out, and all the gulls flew over there, and, and I lost my picture. So it's like you, you never know, and because uh, I love it. Ringbill gulls and breeding plumage are just absolutely fabulous looking things. Window mount, pull up, Western Meadowlark doing his thing. Yellow-headed blackbird, again, Bear River. Um, this is one of those iconic western species, and I was just standing there waiting, watching the males go back and forth, and knew that he was coming back onto that, uh, onto that cattail. Focus as he came in, got it. That's another one we have a very large print on our walls back at, uh, back at the office. And I love looking for little stuff. You know, maybe with the wings being up, maybe the water drops coming off the beak, it's, it's more than just a plain old bird portrait. You, you've got him doing something. This is one of my favorites, oh, one of my favorite ducks, and, and I just love the little water drops all on the head. Um, and that was the old uh, Pentax K100. So it's, you know, that was a seven mega, eight megapixel camera, something like that. American Oyster Catcher, this, I moved to Corpus Christi, Texas uh, six years ago, seven years ago, to get, basically to get away from New England winters. Boy, did I. Um, but this is the, the kind of thing when I drive the beaches down there, we, we pull up to, and uh, again, car window mount. Behavioral things, um, this pelican is definitely, his eyes are bigger than his stomach because he's going to try and get that thing down there and it ain't going to happen. But it was fun watching him. Look, look at all the fish. that are They're all in front of him. There were, all these carp were just packed and these pelicans were just sitting there like, okay, how do we eat all this? Um, I still do race cars occasionally. This is at the Bonneville Salt Flats. That car is about a quarter mile away and he's doing 307 miles per hour. Just learning how to do it, and it's, it's, you can blow that up, and it's nice and sharp. Um, I like to play with airplanes. Um, this was at, from the hotel at the side of the airport runway in um, Atlanta, and late in the day, you can see the streaks. I'm, I'm, I'm practicing my panning and seeing if I can get the smoke coming off the tires and all that. Um, you know, just little diversions. The wonderful thing about digital is we can shoot a thousand pictures, and it costs us nothing but time. Back in the day, it was 35 cents every time you pushed the shutter button and it took you a week to find out if you screwed it up, whereas now you can see if you screwed it up immediately. Uh, Phoenix, uh, the near jet is 1.4 miles away and the far jet is two miles away. Again, shot from the uh, hotel airport and, uh, or the near, airport near the hotel and I was kind of waiting for a knock on the door to come from TSA or something as I'm sitting there pointing lenses at, at planes. 
Um, Atlanta, again, a different time, and that's really the sun setting, and the one plane flew through it. I was there for 15 minutes, and only one plane flew through. I've uh, got some really cool shots. But I think my favorite airplane shot of all was I was shooting pictures at um, uh, Portland, Oregon Airport. Sun went down, I was just packing my stuff up, and I had a full moon started to come up. So, okay, I'm going to shoot the full moon. That was neat. Flight shots. How many, people, how many uh, roseate spoonbills are in the picture? How many? Five. Yeah, there you go. Those were white pelicans flying over my house in Texas with a couple spoonbills. They're about 2,000 feet up. Uh, I do a lot of flight shots, uh, hawks especially. We're on a major hawk migration in Corpus Christi, so things like uh, red-shouldered hawks. Um, beautiful white pelicans in flight. They're just wonderful. This was early in the morning in, in Florida. There were some gray storm clouds to the west, and, and the sun had just risen. They flew through, and I got you know about 10 shots on the sequence as they went by. And that's about, mm, about 2,000 millimeters right there. That's South Padre Island, Texas, and that is absolutely the way it came out of the camera. I did not Photoshop that at all. And that's actually on the flyleaf of the new Peterson Field Guide to Waterbirds in Flight. And that one I call my, my field guide shot, which is female and male, cinnamon teal, upper wing, lower wing, you got everything there. Sequences. Want to be challenging? Dragonflies in flight. <laughs> uh, the green darners have, uh, they patrol. So he comes back to a spot, he's over a spot, he's over a spot, so I'm just waiting for him to get there. I've got a couple seconds to get him framed, get him focused, fire out a couple shots, and away he goes again. And again, you play, spend 15, 20 minutes doing this, and you can get some very cool pictures. You can do macro with, with a spotting scope. Uh, the nice thing is with the, with the, uh, the, the big telephoto effect, uh, with, our, with our 65 millimeter scope, you can actually focus at seven feet at an 1800 millimeter lens. And we do the math and it actually is a true one-to-one -one macro uh, at 60 power with, with a uh, seven foot minimum focus. So um, dragonflies and all that stuff are, are very interesting. Butterflies sitting, uh, you, you have a versatile tool. That's actually my backyard and that uh, it wasn't raining, it was actually the lawn sprinkler was going but he just got popped by a big old drop. Then we can just play artistic. Royal turn portraits are always fun. Okay, so we're getting up to, this is date 2007, so all these shots that you've seen here have been before 2010. Oh, we got a couple, it's 2011 green violet ear in Costa Rica, now you see why they call them violet ear. That's my Olympus EP2, that's the little micro four thirds camera, which I dearly love because of the electronic viewfinder. You can preview your exposure, preview your weight balance, all that good stuff. Um, this was at, literally in a friend's yard, friend's front yard in Oregon, and uh, the, the orange crown warbler just paused right in the middle of the flowering little crab apple tree. Okay, so all those shots were taken with this one. You saw that, you saw that image before. This is our old spotting scope. Uh, in 2011, we came out with a brand new scope. And what we did, we, we did something kind of radical. We made a modular spotting scope. So now you could buy one of three front ends and one of two back ends and mix and match them as you wished. And then the other really cool thing that we did was we designed a lens to work with them. So this is the only lens in the world that's designed to be literally behind a spotting scope eyepiece. Everything else, like I said, the 40 millimeter pancake lenses, 50 millimeter f1.4s, all that stuff were an optical compromise. This baby was designed on the computer at the same time as we made the new scopes to take that scope image and to put it on a flat sensor. And it works beautifully. Uh, you use T-mounts. So this is a T-mount for Micro Four Thirds. The one in the picture there has a T-mount for Nikon. So literally any interchangeable lens camera that you want to put this on, it works nicely. Bang. Done. Simple is good, especially when that bird's not going to let you take time to, to fiddle around and focus with them and all that. So, oops, get back here. So there's, there's the setup. Uh, that's my old EP2 on there. There's me out in the field. I was actually at the San Diego Bird Festival and a friend of mine took, took pictures. I actually remember that, that shot of the little blue heron with the, with, the, with the spray coming off his head? I was shooting that at the time that my, picture, my friend Bruce took the picture of me. So, 
what are we talking about when we're talking a telephoto lens? So this guy right here is the 85 millimeter. We also have the 95 scope out of, out of the booth. And if you look up at the um, second line, it says full frame. So I start out with, with the TLS APO on my camera, and that is a truly a 750 millimeter f8.8 lens. When I zoom it, it goes all the way down to an 1800 millimeter f21. Since the scope is making the image, there's no diaphragm here, we cannot control f-stops. It is what it is, and it's going to drop as you, as you zoom up. Um, this is a manual focus system because the spotting scope is creating the image, the camera lens is just passing it through. So you do give up your autofocus, you do give up the ability to play with depth of field, but it actually starts out at a reasonable size, uh, size because if, if you ever shoot a 600 millimeter f4, at f4 the depth of field is so narrow you can almost do nothing with it, so you typically people stop down anyway. The 95 millimeter scope is a bigger dude, 900 millimeter f9.5, all the way up to 2100 millimeter f22. The rest of the columns, I just figured in the factors for um, the different sensors, an APS sensor like a Nikon, an APS-C like the, the 1.6 for a Canon, Micro Four Thirds, which is the two time, and even over on the end, we, we can actually put iPhones on the scopes and start out as a 700 millimeter lens going up to 1800 millimeters. This is cool stuff. Uh, how many of you have ever heard of uh, LensRentals.com out of Memphis? Roger Sakala is the boss. He's a very neat guy. He writes an incredibly cool uh, photo blog. Um, Roger and I got to play with, with, with the deal. And we actually put my scope, my 95 millimeter scope, next to a Canon uh, 500 millimeter F5, uh, 800 millimeter F5.6. And we shot the same resolution chart at a distance and then played with it and read in the box below, it says the above image has been re resized to fit in WordPress, but the resolution provided quite a shock. The Canon 800 resolved about line 1-3, marked by the red arrow in the center of the image, and the 800 with the 1.4 was about one point of line 1-2. The Swarovski resolved almost exactly the same. The Canon had better contrast, and purple fringing is beginning to show here even in the center of the 40X Swarovski image, but the fact that it can resolve as well as the Canon combination in the center made my jaw drop. And he turned to me and he said, Clay, he says, I'm impressed. I said, Roger, the guys in Austria told me it would do this, but until I saw it for myself, even I was not quite sure. Yes, it's a very cool system. Certainly the Canon beat us up out in the corners, but for, typically for most of our wildlife photography, we're in the center two-thirds of the, of the image anyway. So, um, with my new modular system, I've been out just having a wonderful old time taking pictures. This was at a uh, festival in, um, in Oregon. It's called the Klamath Basin Birding and Photo Festival. And George Lepp was there. This is two years ago. And George had been watching digiscoping over the years, evolving. And, and so I showed him the new system. He says, yeah, okay, that's pretty cool. And we had come back from a morning of shooting and Canon Pro Services was there doing prints like they're doing out here. I printed this one up in a, in a 12 by 18 just as George was walking by and I said, George, what do you think? And he says, wow. He said, that is absolutely publishable. And he said, now I'm impressed. So when George Lepp is impressed, that's a good thing. Uh, the details on some of these things, you can blow them up and, it, and it's quite remarkable. This is a lark sparrow literally in my, in my yard in Texas. So uh, especially for the, for the small birds, the, the 95 millimeter with that starting at 900 millimeters and going up to 2,000, you can get close to the sparrows, you can get close to the hummingbirds, you can get close to the shorebirds and get your shots. Um, how many people have been bird watching down at Cape May, in New Jersey, in the fall? Cape May, right at the, uh, right at the dunes, but over by the bunker. Uh, early light in the morning, palm warbler popped up, sun is, is, is bouncing off the sand, illuminating them underneath. I have this in a print out, out at our booth, you can, you can look at it and it's, it's quite a neat shot. Go back to Costa Rica, um, this is the Pentax K3, still a 60th of a second, green violet ear. Um, but now the nice thing about all the modern SLR cameras, you can crank the ISO up, 1000, 1250, 1600, 2000, and the image quality is remarkable. So, a little uh, volcano hummingbird at uh, Savegre Mountain Lodge. If you've never been there in Costa Rica, that's a place you need to go. Wonderful photography. Um, the hunters are still loving our stuff, and uh, when, when a hunter, uh, a lot of birders say, hunters take pictures? I said, well, they can't always go kill stuff, so they wanted to take pictures because they can show that off to their buddies. So this was out in Oregon. We had bighorn sheep rams. That was about 300 yards away, something like that. It was, it was quite a ways out there. It was first thing in the morning. Um, the sun was behind us, so, or behind the hill, so it wasn't uh, heating up, so the air, air quality was good. 
One of the things that people uh, fall, fall prey to in, in this type of photography is, yeah, I can crank it all the way up to 2,000 millimeters. I'm going to make that thing big. And if it's 100 yards away, now you have 100 yards of atmosphere that you're now magnifying. So you may have a beautiful animal. The lighting is great. He's filling the frame. But the picture comes out soft. It's not you. It's not the camera. It's not the scope. It's the air. And there's only two things to do about that. Come back on a day when the air is calmer or get closer. And there's not a lot you can do. So when we were, when we were taking pictures of the Rams, um, got in a little closer, messed around a little bit, and then the air was, was pretty calm. So I got a very nice shot. This was probably about 135 yards. Uh, I led a tour to Austria last summer with Eagle Optics. And it was a bird watching slash you know, natural history uh, uh, um, cultural tour, and we went to the place, uh, the, the Hohetauren National Park, and we got out, and it was, we're, there were two birds we wanted to see when we got there. We walked, got out of the vans, and here were these beautiful ibex just sitting there waiting for us. It was like, birds? What birds? <laughs> we're taking pictures of ibex. Um, beautiful, do, all do on the grass. Again, I've got this as a print out at the booth. You come by and check this out. And that was um, ISO 1250, and, I, and I, it, it, has no, it has no noise. It's amazing. Critters that you don't want to get too close to, spotting scope's the way to go. That was, uh, a, 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 I did say I moved to Texas, right? Yeah. Um, one of the things that Texas has is rattlesnakes. Uh, I did take this guy out of my yard, put him in a bucket, took him out, put him out on the dirt road, and then took pictures of him as he slithered, slithered away as the mockingbirds just gave him, holy heck. Um, Corpus Christi is right on the ocean, and we get green turtles. I was actually shooting birds, and I, and I looked around. Here, this green turtle poked his head out. Now, this is not the sharpest shot in the world, but it's an, an amazing uh, behavioral shot. That's a whelk snail on his back, kind of hitching a ride. Who knew? But, you know, turn around, get the shot, boom, and, and he's done. Um, again, I have a print of this here. This is a, a, a brown pelican scooping up. You can see the fish's nose at the bottom of the, of the pouch. You can see his fin and the, the, the water, water droplets as it's, as it's flipping its head up. Uh, one sixteen hundredth of a second, ISO 800. Obviously, when birds are sitting still, it makes it easier to do. A um, little closer, you, you can mess with the lighting. The sanderlings are, are tricky because there's so much white and they have the little dark feathers. And I still love backlit stuff. Two thousandth of a second. First thing in the morning at uh, the uh, Space Coast Birding Festival in Titusville, Florida. And just, this is almost a pastel painting. It was very cool. <laughs> he says, I just flew over the Gulf of Mexico. I'm standing on this beach in Galveston, Texas, and you're sneaking up on me? I don't need this. Common eider flyby. This is right up, just not too far from our headquarters in Rhode Island in the middle of winter when it's cold, when it's icy. But hey, the birds are where, where they are. You've got to go find them. How many people have been to the uh, Snow Goose Festival in Bosque del Apache, New Mexico? Oh, what a cool place that is. Sandhill Cranes are there too. A lot of fun, a lot of great photography there. Uh, let's see if this slide works, because it's supposed to be an animation, and it may not show you, but that little dot is, come on, come on, come on, ooh, look at that. Anybody know what that is? International Space Station, flyovers with the scope, about 4,000 ISO, and, and I'm actually hand-holding it. As he goes over the Pentax, my Pentax body has built-in image stabilization. You don't get a lot of good shots, but it's kind of cool because that's 276 miles above my head. <laughs> oh, there we go, 2012. There we go. Yeah, it's K5. One five hundredth of a second ISO 4000. The spotting scope rail is, is essential to making sure that you get this thing balanced because if you have a tail-heavy scope, that will definitely impart shake into, into the picture. So spotting scope rail, and we, Swarovski makes one. Uh, if you have a, you know, a, a really right stuff or, or an Arca Swiss or something like that, sure, there's, there's any, but, but you want to have this thing balanced on your, on your, on your tripod head. Um, definitely good to have a, a good, solid tripod head. And if you're going to do videos with these, I don't even, I don't even cover videos in this, in this show, um, you definitely need to have a, a fluid head for that kind of stuff. 
Back to Costa Rica, 1 25th of a second, 1 25th of a second, not 125th. Um, so you have to go through a lot of shots. This is where the micro four thirds cameras, especially with the electronic shutter, are very handy. That is, I just shot that uh, a month and a half ago. That's 1 15th of a second, ISO 500. We have a print of that, and it is really neat. Um, thankfully, we didn't have any wind blowing the branches that day. Same, same bird, cranked up to the 1800 millimeters on the scope. So that is now a 1800 times the two of the micro four thirds. It's effectively a 3600 millimeter lens. And it's one sixth of a second, ISO 500. I use the electronic shutter. And I actually fired the shutter using the Panasonic app for my iPhone. So it was totally hands off, no, no motion whatsoever. This kind of technology didn't exist just a couple years ago. So augments what we already have with the scope. <laughs> Can you believe that's a one half second exposure? The light was brutal. This is a little red cap mannequin who's merely about three inches, four inches long. Um, quite amazing what you can do with these things. I do other action stuff. Uh, surfer at uh, San Diego, um, San Diego River. And that was late in the day and I did not pump up the, 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 uh, the colors. That was what was there. I, this was back when I was still shooting mostly JPEGs and so I didn't expose that one as good as I would like to. Uh, now that I'm doing, doing more prints, I'm shooting more raw. So, you know, one of those, I'm, I've got to go back there and try and recreate, re recreate that. I still do race cars. Um, Circuit of the Americas is only three hours away from me in Texas. So I go see the Le Mans cars. These are all shot from the spectator area and even the Formula One race, which is a lot of fun to shoot pictures of. Handheld, the 35, the, the, the 65 millimeter scope, handheld with the with the camera with the image stabilization from a boat. Because if you've ever taken the, the boat tours down in South Texas for the whooping cranes, you know you're out on the boat getting into their area. He had he had he was flying in to go uh, drive out a, a a rival crane. So uh, again, I've got a print of that one too, and it's it's quite remarkable. ISO 1600, 1600 of a second, and it's neat. <laughs> I've done, I don't know how many whale watches I've been on over the years, started back in the 70s. And two summers ago, we were out on the whale watch off of uh, Gloucester, Massachusetts. And here I am with the 65 scope, and the whale started breaching. She did six consecutive breaches, and she was so close that I couldn't get all of her into the picture. Uh, that was the one time I kind of was wishing I only, only had a 400 millimeter lens instead of 750. But even still, it was very cool. And then there's just stuff. You can go out and just have fun taking lots of very cool pictures of birds, of sunsets, of insects, and all that stuff. Because the nice thing is, it goes from being a spotting scope to a telephoto lens instantly. So you can get long-eared owl. This was in, in California. Uh, pinnated bittern down in, in Costa Rica. Here's one of my failings as, as a photographer. I am... I, 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 I'm wishy-washy. You know, do I like the, the horizontal format? Do I like the vertical format? Do I like the cool temperature? Do I like the warm temperature? I can never, I can never decide. Because that, that was what Photoshop said was the correct white balance. I think I kind of like the warm, warm, warm temperatures a little bit better, but hey. ISO 3200, go look at the print out of my booth. It's kind of cool. Uh, it, it almost adds a little bit of, of uh, um, Oh, I don't, I don't know what the right term would be, but it, it adds a little um, symbol of stylist and stylistic to it, but it's, it's a cool picture. Virginia Rail, anybody ever try to take pictures of rails? This thing popped his head out, I got three shots, and he was gone. Ibis, on the other hand, this is at the Wildlife Drive at Black Point in um, Merritt Island, and we had just this mass of Ibis and, and, and herons and egrets all brought from here to the exit sign away. And it was a matter of just taking pictures until you got tired of it or your batteries or your memory filled up. You know. Snow goose shot from the car at Bosque del Apache. <laughs> it was probably oh, from here to the, to the railing over there. And the, one of my favorites, uh, this was just a sleeping uh, a northern shoveler down at a place called the Port Aransas Birding Center in Port Aransas, Texas, which is a fabulous place for bird photography, especially water birds, especially in the wintertime. So with that, um, we're coming up on the 145, so David's not going to zap me. Um, 
This is, our, this is the first time that we Swarovski Optic have done something with B&H on the photo side. We actually do quite well with them selling binoculars to the bird watchers and to the hunters and all that. So I hope to be part of more photo optics events in the future. And what I'd like to, to tell you guys is if any of you are out there interested in this system, you know, come and talk with us. We'll be happy to help you out. I've got data, data sheets and all that stuff. Um, and next year, if I'm back here doing this program, I would like to have some of your photos in this to show what the customers are doing. And I'll also probably throw in some videos too, because especially since I bought the GH4, I can shoot 4K video with this, which is 30 frames a second, trap a still out of it, and it's an eight megabyte still image. That's not bad. So, the motto for Swarovski Optic, the world belongs to those who can see beauty, experience the moment, and then I add in, take a picture of it, <laughs> see the unseen. Thank you very much. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, B&H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.